Hello and welcome back and today we're going to talk about virtual machines. Okay, so first things first, let's address it. What the hell is a virtual machine? Because surely all machines are just computers and a virtual machine is ethereal and I can't touch it. Well, yes and no. A virtual machine is actually both of those things at the same time. A virtual machine is a computer that you can access anywhere. It normally is restricted to network bandwidth, but what it effectively is are multiple computers that in physicality all exist within one device, a server. And NASes are fast becoming the most popular means with which home users get, can get their hands on virtual machines. Think of the number of times at university, at libraries, and basically anywhere we had a series of PCs all lined up for basic, you know, web browsing or word processing work. And these machines had very modest specs inside. Well, more than likely you were dealing with virtual machines. Machines whereby there's one giant computer somewhere in the vicinity in a server room in a back cupboard somewhere, and this one machine on it has got these virtual profiles, each profile being assigned with a certain amount of CPU and memory and an identity. And then all the other machines are working as terminals that project virtually that machine. That you, the machine they're on isn't a virtual machine. The machine you're using is just a very basic computer like the ones we have around us. But with a virtual machine, I can use a device like this um, tablet here that I use for my scripts, and I can access and run a fully fledged Windows machine that can exist anywhere in the world. And that's one of the main reasons for the popularity of virtual machines, the versatility of having access to a single point. Now, a virtual machine on NAS is very much the same principle, because just like using it on any computer, because again, you don't need a NAS to build a virtual machine, uh, but a NAS can be utilized to not only run as a NAS with all its usual Plex and backups and all the other features and functionality, but installing first and third party software on the device that's normally always for free will allow you to be able to create this virtual computer and this virtual computer that lives on the NAS which you know in the sake of QNAP you can attach a keyboard mouse and you know an HDMI monitor but in most cases this virtual computer cannot be accessed in the traditional means of accessing it like you would a computer. These virtual machines can be accessed via a web browser or using maybe Windows remote connection tool and therefore using any machine be it a, a Mac a Chromebook, a mobile phone, or a Windows PC, you can access that virtual machine anywhere with a network or internet connection. Now, the popularity of virtual machines isn't just about business and enterprise, and uh, you know, having lots of staff or little drones all coming in using computers. There's actually a number of reasons why virtual machines have become very, very popular indeed. I mean, for a start, the pros and cons of virtual machines, let's go by the script number one, a virtual machine gives you the ability to bench test updates and bench test new operating systems. So there are lots of tools out there, and again, for Mac, for Windows, for Android, that let you create a system image of your machine that you're currently on. So if you're using, um, if you're watching this video, again, on a tablet, a PC, a laptop, whatever, you can find normally free tools from your respective uh, operating system vendor, uh, like you know, in Windows or whatever, and Microsoft, and you can create a system image. That is a disk image of your entire computer right now. All the files, every folder, every single part of it. And then that system image, which normally is an ISO file like the one on the screen, um, this system image can be put on a USB stick, it can be put anywhere, uh, and then retrieved with the VM. So once you've got that system image and you're worried about whether an update is going to corrupt your systems, you're wondering whether installing some piece of software is going to be, uh, you know, have an impact on your system, what you can do is get that VM, then use a VM software to create a virtual copy of your machine. Again, irrespective of it being Windows, Mac, Android, whatever. And then with that virtual machine, you can run tests and then see what the outcome would be with testing your OS after an update or a brand new operating system. And if that works, brilliant. Then you can update your physical hardware properly and then everything's fine. And what that does is give you the ability to avoid you know, irreplaceable data loss, avoid complete system bricking. Because if a VM bricks, all it does is the VM in that floaty window there uh, that you've got on your remote connection or via your web browser or on one of those tabs, you just close the tab and you're fine. Um, 
Another one is to you experiment, experiment with different operating systems because not only can you clone your existing operating system as an, uh, as an image file, that ISO, and then run it in a VM, but you can buy, download, or even you know online, there's lots of different versions of different operating systems. So say you're a Mac user and you want to try something out in Windows, you can download a virtual copy of Windows, Windows 7, 8, 10, even XP and back. And these virtual copies of Windows can run within the Mac in a window, in a web browser. And then you can bench test things and it, can, it runs like a completely separate machine. And the same goes if you run a Windows machine and you want to try Mac, but with Mac you will have to run programs like Hackintosh, which are a little bit dodgy. And of course Android is completely available with a lot of freeware out there for you to try. Um, Another one of the key things for VMs, and one of the reasons VMs are very popular at the moment, is because of things like Windows XP. There are loads and loads of programs that no longer run with Windows 7, 8, and 10. And moreover, there are older systems, like again, horrible, sad, sad areas of the NHS and areas of the security industry, which still use very old, unupdated versions of XP, which are susceptible to ransomware. So. If you upgrade, sometimes you're going to have a, a difficulty retrieving old files, opening old um, programs, and having a VM that runs something like Windows 98 or Windows XP will give you access to old files, old programs, old games like um, Half-Life 1, programs that run with difficulty on the latest platforms. And personally, the late, latest VM I did was to run Jedi Academy, an old game that came out for 2002. There's no way that would run on a modern machine now because of Open 3GL or G3L even. There's loads of examples like that. Now, there are also basic editing tools that can only be run from zip folders, which again, some systems will not let you open. So say you're using an Android machine and you want to run um, a very you know detailed tool that would run in a Windows environment, you can create a Windows VM um, with something like VirtualBox or something like that, and from that VM extract something from a zip file that your Android device can't run, and then run the tool or pull over what you can. There's loads of ways in which VMs have become very, very popular with home users. Um, now, running them on a NAS is a slightly different story because depending on which NAS brand you go for, the limitations of how much you can do with VMs will change. Looking at the main companies, you've got Synology, QNAP, Acer Store, Thekus, that sort of thing. Um, now, with Synology and QNAP, they have their own proprietary software. They've got their own first-party software with Synology. It's called Synology Virtual Machine Manager. And with QNAP, it's called Virtualization Station. Now, Synology will let you run one VM, but after that, you have to pay for licenses for more VMs. It's a much more user-friendly tool, but you will have a limitation very early on. QNAP will let you run as many VMs as you want, but, of course, it's a little bit more complex than the, Q, uh, than the Synology tool, but a lot of you might want to tinker those options. And, of course, in the QNAP tool, you can actually download copies of Windows 7, 8, 9, and 10 as a trial version. So you can actually test. You can have a VM up and running inside three minutes if you choose. Now, Acer Store and Thekus run a freeware application called VirtualBox. And VirtualBox gives you the ability to run everything, including that Hackintosh software we mentioned earlier on, as well as more container-based applications as well. QNAP and Synology do support those, but nowhere near to the same depth of VirtualBox. So again, these are the main tools you're going to find in NAS, either the first-party tools from QNAP and Synology or VirtualBox on a multitude of smaller NAS platforms. It's really easy to get a VM up and running. I mean, there's stuff like a VM workstation, VM creation software, and Hyper-V are all just official Microsoft tools for running VMs, whereby the app will run on your local machine or local machines, and the core files and the distribution of those files is conducted on the NAS, and therefore it lifts a lot of the work off the NAS and that first party software, and it's worth bearing in mind. Now, if you're interested in setting up your VM for the very first time, then do go to the comments below and the description to find links to our other videos and guides on how to set up a VM on a Synology or QNAP NAS. But if you are interested in setting up a VM for the first time, there are rules. Much like Gremlins, there are three core rules. Rule number one, when you're setting up a VM, you are going to be dedicating portions of your CPU to that virtual machine. So make sure you've got a CPU that's at least quad core. Do not um, try to run a VM on a dual core CPU. The system, if you dedicate one of the cores to the VM and you've only got one core running your entire NAS, the degradation and slow um, 
product um, uh, the processes the slower processes on your NAS will affect the VM as well rule number two make sure you run an AR um, sorry, uh, an Intel or AMD based CPU something that's an x86 class chip if you run an ARM more than likely it will not run a VM very well at all third rule is to do with memory make sure you've got plenty of memory on your machine VMs are a vampire for memory you want at least four gig of memory on your NAS again top of my head I would recommend the Synology DS918 plus the QNAP TS453B and the AS6202T from Acer Store. These are the three NASs I'd recommend right now to get your hands dirty with VMs. And do bear in mind those last two, the QNAP and the Synology, uh, the QNAP and the Acer Store, have got um, USB and HDMI ports. So you can connect a keyboard, a mouse, a monitor, and you've got a standalone PC as well that can be accessed anywhere where you need it. So you can work at this machine, tappity, 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 then Go to work, on the commute, use your 4G, access the same VM, tappity, tappity, tappity. Go to work, access it, tappity, tappity, tappity. I did the same thing in Germany just a few months ago for CBIT. But if you're interested in learning more, visit the guides there in the description. Buy your NAS from Span.com. And of course, forget, don't forget to subscribe here on the YouTube channel and on NAS Compares to learn more and see all the guides and the firmware updates and more information and news on NAS. Thank you so much for watching.